Hey, welcome to Beyond the Barrel Podcast. I'm your host, John Doc Rowley. With us, as always, is that dude that can't silence his damn cell phone to save his life, it. Kyle Mason. What hey, up, guys. Dude? <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's Every, the, uh, he's, I don't know why it's so hard. Mama. It's the baby mama. Hey, guys, today we have a Marine Corps veteran, and you guys probably know him better than me because he's with uh, Barstool Sports. He's a blogger and the host of Zero, Bo- Zero Blog 30 Podcast and the Chaps and Kate Show. His name is Uncle Chaps. What up, dog? What's up, man? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So I got a, I got a question, man. I got to ask you, right? So if I'm a professional athlete, my biggest fear is not fucking up in my next game. It's being chapsed, right? Is that the, <laughs> is that the term, right? Like if I'm a professional athlete, that is the last thing I want to do. Um, yeah, I would say getting chaps like used to mean more so for journalists than athletes. Athletes didn't really give a fuck about what was going on, but getting chaps was, that was kind of how I got my name really out there in bigger circles. I wouldn't say that's how I got a following, but definitely when like people like Big Cat started to notice. So I would just change my Twitter name and handle. And then I kind of studied like how Ian Rappaport and it, and Adam Schefter would talk like on Twitter and online. And so I would adjust my <laughs> tweets whenever I was trying to be them. And it, it worked and it would get thousands of people. I mean, to the point where... I'm decent friends with the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars son. And he was like, he told me years afterwards, this Olivier Vernon tweet that went out, the Jags and the giants were the two last teams competing to get Olivier Vernon, the free agent edge rusher. And I said that he had signed a deal with Jacksonville. It was a done deal. It was going to be for four years, $45 million or whatever the numbers were. And it turns out that the Giants saw that report, called the agent, was like, we'll up the numbers a little bit. So really, me as a Jags fan, I cost the Jags the the preeminent edge rusher of that free agent class because I was fucking around online. So, So, okay, my interpretation of what you're telling me is it's not Trump that actually coined fake news. It's you. Yeah. Is that what yeah, you're telling I think us? I was the original, at least in sports media world, I was the original fake news. And no, I, I won't say original. Two of my buddies that are in Jack's Twitter used to do it all the time. Shout out Andy Willis and, uh, and a couple other dudes. Dilla used to do it too. So a few other fellas used to do it as well. But I somehow got the credit, even though the credit should not go to me. Well, we'll for the for the purposes of this podcast, we'll let you own it for the next hour yeah, or so. That well, was very humble of me too, right? Like absolutely. giving credit to somebody else. Unbelievable. Yeah, hum- hum- we're all about humble bragging, right? <laughs> if, you're, we, if, you're, <laughs> if your wife is home, go ahead and yell to the other room, tell her to bring some ice in so you can uh, get that shoulder. We don't want it to get tight. Mm-hmm. We got a long show mm-hmm. ahead of us. So uh, I know we were talking about a little bit of this offline, but uh, I mean, even your own company. Right. Like you, the, the name Chaps, Uncle Chaps, like it's so synonymous with you that people have actually forgotten your real name. Like people don't even know your real name. Like people, the closest people in your like little circle of friends didn't even know yeah, your and real I'll, name. I'll say go a step further. The only people in my life that call me Matthew still is my wife and my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Almost across the board or dad. Like, so I got to have two that call me dad and two that call me Matthew. And that is it. I mean, everyone else in my life calls me chaps. So even now, if I'm not really locked into what my wife is saying and she tries to get my attention by saying Matthew, I don't even pay attention because no one calls me Matthew at this point. And it all started like Marine Corps because I used to work. Uh, presidential security with HMX one, like alongside of HMX one, I was at Marine Corps base Quantico, but we would do searches all the time and we would do shit in DC constantly. And when we were going out and drinking. We all wanted to have like aliases in case somebody, something went down. We didn't want to get like called to the first sergeant and deal with all that kind of shit. So everybody had fake names. Mine just happened to be Chaps McNeely. And so when I got online and started to try to build an online presence, because I originally wanted to just work in local media in Jacksonville, be like a Jacksonville Jaguars radio guy. That was my my ultimate goal was to be on the radio talking about the Jags. 
it ended up blowing up way more than that. And I'm so thrilled of where I ended up, but that's what I wanted to do. And so I used that name while I was still on active duty. <laughs> and now it's just what everybody calls me. Everybody calls me. even my mail, like my, my mailman <laughs> a couple weeks ago was like, you got some mail here for Matthew Coffin. Is that you? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me, man. And they, the mail didn't even know. <laughs> Talking about an alias, that, that reminds me of a story when I was in uh, Colorado. One of my platoon mates that I was in Afghanistan with, uh, when we got to the bars, he would tell people his name was Tom. Uh, and then they asked what his last name, his name, last name was Ados. And I was like, hold on, motherfucker. You're, you're telling these bitches that your name is Tomatoes? And he's like, yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that? Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on, Steve. You can't do that shit. <laughs> but so so you were you were doing presidential security. Um, how did you get into that? Were you at 0311? No, I was a dog handler. So everywhere, uh, every anytime a cabinet member or above goes anywhere, they have to have explosive support. And so I was a bomb dog handler and we would go constantly with whether it be like the secretary of state or the vice president or the president, we would go with them all over the world. That's pretty fucking legit. Yeah. yeah. It was fun. That's uh, how, how long did you do that for? Almost 10 years. Ooh, man, that's like halfway to retirement. Yeah. So I got shot in Fallujah in 2007. Um, I was with first recon battalion there and i got shot there and then i got retired three years afterwards from some of the effects of that i have traumatic brain injury and a couple other things but i thought i was going to be in the marine corps forever man like i was as ate up about being a marine as you could possibly be and go further with the chaps like people only know me as chaps i've had several marines that worked for me uh whenever i was the company gunner sergeant on quantico that had no idea listening to zero block 30 for two years before they figured out I was me. Like they didn't know that their old (laughs) company gunner sergeant was working at Barstool. They just thought I was some dude and they liked the show. Um, John Paxson's son, who used to play for the Bulls, Ryan Paxson is his name. He was a drill instructor and he put it together after a while and he messaged me. He's like, I know this is going to sound crazy, but are you really Staff Sergeant Cothran? And I was like, yeah, that's that's me. And he was like, holy fucking shit, man. I had no idea (laughs) that you were like how you are. I had no idea that you were funny. I had no idea that you were entertaining. I just thought you were the biggest dick to ever walk the face of the earth. (laughs) I was like, yeah, well, I take that as a compliment. I have two sides to myself. (laughs) So how do you, because I mean, that's... I mean that's a that's a high tempo job, right? How do you yeah. find how do you find the time to jump into podcasting? Because I mean, just between the two of us, I mean it's the one of us really. I do all of it. Yeah, okay, whatever. I'll let him believe that for for the sake of the story. <laughs> but but I mean, how do I'm you just kidding? How do you jump into that? Because you're still active duty at this at this point. When you're like, hey, you know what? This is pretty cool. I'm gonna hop on this on this train oh, and see where so it goes. So I actually went back to school. So I got medically retired. I fought it for a little while, got medically retired. And when I did that, I went to UTSA. And because school had always kind of come decently easy for me, unless I had to learn something new, like I'm not good at foreign languages, I'm not good at math. But whenever I like writing and doing all that stuff, I was a a communications major. That was nothing for me. I was I was always been pretty good at it. So instead of paying attention in class, like I probably should have, I just tweeted my dick off. Essentially, I just tweeted all day, every day, (laughs) talking about the Jags, making jokes online, doing that kind of thing. And when right when I graduated school, I I had been done for like two weeks and I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I had my retirement from the VA, my Marine Corps money. The GI Bill was coming to a close and I was like, I really got to figure out what the fuck I'm going to do here. And I went into my closet. I ordered a little mic off of Amazon, put a little uh, lav mic inside a shoe box with some egg carton mattress foam inside there and <laughs> talked into it. And with some of the connections that I had made, I had Ian Rappaport as my first, um, first guest that I ever had on the show. PFT commenter, who's on part of my take with Big Cat, he had just gotten hired. And some dude that an egg avatar on Twitter tagged Dave Portnoy, my boss, um, the founder of Barcelona Sports. They tagged him in a tweet and was like, this dude's pretty funny. You should check him out. He happened to be at the airport, happened to have time, listened to it, thought it was funny, reached out to me, asked me if I could write. I said yes, and then offered me a full-time job. Five years later, here we are. Holy crap. 
Damn. And so you, when did you get out? When did you separate active duty? Um, I got out in 2012. 2012. Okay, cool. Yeah, the, the very end of 2012. So that had to be, that, I mean, we got out our, I mean, you know, our, my separate, at least my separation story was, is a lot smoother than yours. I can only imagine, you know, getting out, especially being medically discharged and saying, sayonara, dude, you're no longer good for us. They got a full retirement. So that helps. Yeah. But I mean, that's, yeah. but, but, but like, you're right. Cause I mean, that was my entire life. Like I was a meritorious staff sergeant, combat awards, awards for valor, like all those things lining up for me to be, I wanted to be a star major in the Marine Corps. That was my goal. I used to tell everybody all the time, I want to be a Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps. That's my goal. That's my goal. That's my goal. But I look back now and the the situations that I found myself in that led to my discharge, like the PTSD, the traumatic brain injury, all those things. If I didn't have that in my back pocket, I wouldn't have the perspective on life that I do now. And I think looking back, it's a, it's a huge blessing. Like I always wanted to be in that role because I thought one of my biggest strengths was mentoring junior Marines. Now I have the opportunity to talk to so many more service members. So many more people get my input on a weekly, bi-weekly basis about what my ideas are for the world, how I view things, how I view people, how I feel like you should deal with conflict and deal with different political issues or different social issues. My voice is amplified because of Barstool and 99% of what I do at Barstool is humorous, but I'm also in a position where I can talk about serious shit like mental health. I fucked up big time as a company gunny. I was awful in everything that I preach against now, as far as being the person who PTSD is a weakness. Uh, like you shouldn't do, you should just man up, man through it, get through it. Everybody's done it. Nobody in world war two was bitching about it. Nobody in Vietnam was bitching about it. Why the fuck are you bitching about it? You little pussy. Now I look back and I regret huge, like big time, the biggest regrets in my life deal with that type of subject that I wasn't the staff NCO that I needed to be to a lot of different Marines. And I feel like this is a second opportunity for me to right that wrong. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about that actually for a second. We, um, we had talked about this a little bit with, with one of our previous guests, but I I think it's probably worth talking about with you. Um, that very well might have been the correct answer at the time. Because think about it, right? You guys are training for combat. You're training for war. We've been in war for the past 20 years. Um, I was in a, I, I was in a uh, infantry unit. I was a medic uh, on an infantry uh, line. Kyle was with uh, SEAL Team 3 and 8 and Deb eight, Grew. 8 and 10. Or eight eight and 10. 10 or whatever, whoever he was with. I can't remember. Um, but you're training for war at that time, right? So mm-hmm. telling guys that they need to suck it up sometimes might be the right answer. It might be the wrong answer and at some point. I, I understand what you're saying, but I also feel like we view this in such a, a, a skewed way. Like the way that we have been taught military mental health is just, uh, to me, it's just so incredibly fucked up. You would never look at somebody that's like, hey, Gunny, my fucking tooth is hurting, man. Like I, <laughs> I, clear, I, have a, I need a root canal bad. Listen, you little fucking bitch. Suck it up. We're going to combat. (laughs) To me, you got to view mental health almost like as the brain dentist is what I call it on my show, where you might not be sure you don't have the time or the ability to sit back and lay on a couch for fucking 10 hours and talk about all your problems that you ever had and what your dad did and what your mom did and how it's all fucked up. You don't have time for that, but you definitely have time to go get some checkups to be like, hey, The last appointment that I was on, I saw a kid with a brain hanging out. Like, I I might need to talk to somebody about that. I think that that is something that should be absolutely encouraged. Antidepressants is nothing to be ashamed of. Anti-anxiety is nothing to be ashamed of. And the more that we get to that spot in the military, the better off you're going to be. Because if you have a group of people who are trying to hide depression and push through the depression or push through anxiety, you're going to have tactical mistakes. You're going to have people that aren't paying attention when they need to be. You need people in combat zones to be as sharp as they absolutely can. Yeah. And you can't do that with the gorilla monster that is depression hanging on your shoulders. No, no. you can't. And I, I was more talking about, I'm not talking about like back in the rear. I was talking about more like downrange, like, Oh, the, sure. Yeah. Like I don't a, think we should add stress cards in actual combat when yeah. rounds are flying down. We're like, like, hey, guys. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hey there, training yeah, time out. Training time out, guys. Yeah. 
Yeah, your boy's I mean, depressed. <laughs> I need, I need a little quick time out. I'll meet you back here in a week, but I gotta go see the wizard for yeah. a minute. Can we can we just take a day off, dude? Just one day. That's all I I'm just, asking. I, just, I mean, that would be nice, though, right? Like it if would. there's like a gentleman's agreement. Kind of like in I, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Civil War, they used to have a gentleman's agreement because diarrhea was so prevalent on the front lines there and dysentery and shit that they had a gentleman's agreement. If somebody was clearly shitting in a hole, you do not shoot them. You do not rush at them. You don't do anything. You have a gentleman's agreement. That man has diarrhea. Leave him the fuck alone. <laughs> and you, and you, you're the expert on that. I mean, you've had am, it since yeah. 2007, right? 2008, yeah. 2007? Easter, 2007. Yeah, Damn. exactly right. That is, oh, that is, God. that's a, some burning buttholes right there. No, is, you, yeah. chaps, you make, you make a fantastic point, man. And I, uh, I'm I'm all about mental health. I think, especially in, you know, and I I had a lot of the same views you did when I was active duty, and now that I've separated, I've gone through, you know, my own issues and, and worked through those, still working through those, and, and having a kid, and and just you know, generally being an older, wiser, you know, more sexy man. Um, yeah. I, I I my perspective has definitely changed, and I've mm-hmm. I, and after going through counseling, and and facing you know my my fight with you know my my issues with depression anxiety and certain things like that um and i and realizing how much counseling has helped me and continues to help me and and then you listen to your your jockos and your rockos right who Mm -hmm. you know badass dudes right who i mean jocko you know the first thing things he says to unfuck yourself is counseling 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 right and so i think it is as veterans no that's rocco not jocko 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 says you need discipline Everybody read this book, read this book. <laughs> oh, no, well, Jocko and Rocco, they both, they both preach it. <laughs> Point is, is us, uh, you know, I think, I think we do. And, and, and we, we have, it's incumbent upon us to try and. Uh, Unbelievable use of incumbent. Yes, there's a thank you. Th- see, well done. Thank you. I appreciate it, sir. <laughs> Can we get a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. But Double it's a- enlisted dude just throwing out words like incumbent. Gotta love yeah. that. <laughs> I'm gonna Google it later, guys. <laughs> he, he's not mine. He has no idea what the fuck the word means. He's Googling it right now. Spell it. <laughs> well, it's, it's definitely taboo. And I think, and for me, speaking for myself, I don't know about you two, but I remember. I'm sure you got guys had this, like, you know, your CEO or whoever your, your platoon leader was be like, my door is open 24 seven. You can tell me anything. Well, that's mm-hmm. just fucking bullshit. Right. Cause there's, oh. there's certain things that you couldn't tell. And one of those things are, you know, there was that kind of sense of, and, and, and back to your point too, when it comes to uh, world war two and Vietnam and, and previously, you know, there wasn't a, there was like zero research done on the mental effects of war on, you know, adults. And now, especially, you know, and, and as you well know, um, I mean, IEDs have been so prevalent and you have these TBIs. And so there's a lot more research on how combat and trauma affects the brain. And, how- and reporting was so different, too. Like we look back now and we say World War Two was so different and Vietnam was so different. Well, the reporting that the VA did on suicides was not existent. Yeah, like the numbers. I bet if we had accurate reporting of the numbers of suicides that came about from World War Two, it would be astronomical. But you would have people like, "Oh, he had a heart attack in his shed." Well, was was it by a bottle? Did he have a pill there as well? Like, and you're. It was so. It was some. It was a social almost shaming that happened if it was a suicide related death that it what it didn't get out. It stayed within the family, and that happened all the time. I interviewed one guy. His name is Stanley Rubin. He was ninety four years old whenever I interviewed him. He was in the Battle of Iwo Jima. He was in all kinds of the island hopping campaigns in World War II. Marine, an unbelievable man. Listen, listening to his stories were incredible. Closing out the interview, and it was one of the most one of the most phenomenal conversations I've ever had. And I probably spoke thirty words the entire time, and it lasted about two hours. He's ninety four years old. I sat down with him. He started going through what happened to him in World War II. He didn't stop speaking essentially for ninety minutes. Whenever he was done, I asked him, I was like, Stanley, whenever you came back, did you feel like you got any type of treatment for PTSD or anything after all the things you went through? And he looked at me and he was like, son, I don't, you know, I I understand what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. I feel bad for you guys and what you and the women that are going there have had to deal with. But I didn't, I don't feel like I had PTSD. He's like, no, 
that's not i haven't had a solid night's sleep in 75 years i feel like i have to constantly wash my back they just don't know what it is like they yeah. called it a thousand yard stare or anything like that and it was the same exact thing it was ro- a rose called by another name like it was the same exact situations that we're dealing through this has been since the foundations of the earth were laid. This is what people who have gone to combat have dealt with. We just now have a more scientific approach of how to deal with it. So that the next generation, when there is more combat, which there inevitably will be, we have a better chance to have less numbers than the 21 a day. Well, here's a here's an interesting fact that I didn't know until just now. Uh, all three of us are actually older than the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs. Um, the VA wasn't enacted until 1989. So right. bef- before that, there was, I mean, they weren't doing anything for, for uh, post-veteran, I, I, I'm i guessing, uh, post-military health. Uh, health. Well, it was just called something else. Like they, they had mm-hmm. the same type of things. Like you have VA payments, like the same type of thing that's been going on since essentially the Civil War. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah. That- I mean, it's, it's grown and it's, 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 uh, you know, um, advanced in, in certain ways. And now the VA is just a... The, the cover for it now, you know, the, the medical system that the government uses, but it, I mean, yeah, it's, it, you're right. I mean, there was, there wasn't a scientific approach back then. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I can only speak for, you know, what I've heard from my grandfather's, my, one of my grandfathers was out of Alaska and didn't see any combat. And then my other was, was he, he was part of the Island hopping campaign. He, um, he was on Iwo Jima and he was telling me a story about they had captured Iwo Jima and they were sleeping there on the beach and they were still hunting, hunting down, um, you know, the Japanese fought to the last man and they were still, you know, they were doing a guerrilla campaign. And he was mm-hmm. telling me about how one of his best friends was in the tent next to him and they woke up the next morning and his throat was slit. The Japanese had gone in there and they, they executed everybody in that tent, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, it's when he talks about it, you can tell how much it weighs on him, but it's not, it, it doesn't click over that, I, you know, how this, how, how this has affected me, how's affected his life over the last, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. And there's a reason why the men and women of the last generation don't talk about it. One, because it wasn't publicly acceptable to talk about. Yep. And that's one of the main reasons why I started zero block 30 is because the library of your stories disappear whenever you can't check out books anymore. And I want my children to be able to go back and listen to my words about my experiences. And I think that the individual veterans story is so important. Sure, there is going to be stories like Generation Kill. There is going to be stories like what happened in Restrepo. Those stories are gonna be out there, but those are so few and far between and the individual veterans own perspective on each and individual story is important. And what you experienced, not you specifically, but what you experienced in Fallujah or Ramadi or Marja or wherever you went, what you experienced is your own individual story at that time. And it is your truth. You're not going to be able to have a story like a uh, fucking Chris Kyle or somebody like that, but you have your own and having your own story and your own narrative about that is incredibly important even if not for everybody else to consume, because a lot of people don't give a fuck about a lot of people's story. I don't give a fuck about a lot of people's story, but your family <laughs> sure as shit does. And like hearing you talk about that is it's freeing for them. They want to know the story. So hearing it from the individual veteran who might not have hundreds of thousands of followers on social media or who might not have a book deal, your story still matters. And I think that's the point of Zero Block 30. We try to be a platoon room is what we call a lot of our episodes where we just go in, everybody sits down, everybody's equal, even Connor, that motherfucker. <laughs> we sit back <laughs> and we just enjoy each other's company and talk really like only veterans do. Like there's subsets of culture all across the United States. And that's what makes America great is that we have different pockets. I was just in Minnesota recently and driving through Minnesota and seeing different areas of Minneapolis that predominantly Muslim, predominantly from Zimbabwe, prom- prominently from Guana. And then you have like your folks that are farming and things like that. That is what makes America special. And in those subsets of culture, you also have veterans and active duty members. And I think expanding on those stories is is a really beautiful thing because this culture is so special and so different from anything else that America has to offer. Yeah. And, Couldn't agree more. And, and telling the stories and listening to the stories is very cathartic for a lot of people, especially those have, that have had trauma. Listening mm-hmm. to other people's traumas and relating with them and seeing that, hey, 
this person had to deal with combat and death and, you know, sacrifice and heartache and, you know, getting shot and all this other shit. Uh, and, and they see beyond all of that, they're able to succeed. So it, right. it gives them a little bit of a little hope. Like I can do that too. Yeah. Well, and a- there is this aspect of what I like to call my favorite quote that I ever learned in the military was bloom where you're planted. Recently, when I was in Minnesota, I talked to a dude named John Kessel, lost both of his legs in Iraq. And he goes out there and golfs and lives the best possible life that he can. To me, my message that I ha- that I want to give out to veterans is that there is a lot of times where you ha- you are almost shorted because of your experiences of, that you have. You don't feel like it when you get out. You get out as an E6. You get out as an E7. You get out as a sergeant. You get out as a young lieutenant, a young captain. And you had all this responsibility. The average civilian cannot possibly fathom what a 23, 24 year old has responsible responsibility for in many of the branches of service. So then when you get out and you want a job, you want a job that matches what you believe your skill sets are. You believe that you're in a position to be a manager, like that you have been in that position, not just in that position to lead. You've led when rounds are coming down range. And that's a lot more intense than when Karen is at the fucking counter (laughs) trying to give you shit. Like, so you've been in those spots and you feel like that you've earned it. And then you have to go back and start at square one, even though your recruiter, your military members, your family, they they want you to continue to excel and on that path that you were on when you're in the military. And you feel like you're kind of just spinning your wheels a little bit. Right. Like that's I, to me, I think that is the most common struggle for veterans when they leave the military. If they didn't do 20 years or even when they did, is that you leave and you're like, fuck, man, like. I did some shit. I wasn't like some dumbass fuck. Like, that's not what I did. I know what I'm talking about. I can lead. I can lead. But then you have to have the ability to step back and be like, okay, well, I'll do this for a little bit. I'll step back for a little bit and know that the training that I have, know that my experiences are going to set me apart and then I'm going to keep pushing forward. I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. I might be starting as like a shift manager. I might be starting as a shift worker, but I am going to bust my dick off and I'm going to, I'm going to move up. I'm going to move up. And you, you, you make a incredibly poignant point there. Um, I think, you know, just being a veteran under normal circumstances, it's so isolating when you get out in many ways, right? Cause mm. you're, you lo- you have a lot, not only are you dealing with a loss of purpose on some level, a loss of tribe, like, you know, just the general, I think perception that most, that a lot, I don't want to say most, but a, a segment of the population, the civilian population might have on veterans, right? So taking all the, the experiences and the trauma that you may have, apart, you're already dealing with a lot of shit, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so, you know, it, what is it? Less two per, less than 2% of the population has ever served. Even less than that has served in the combat. Even less than that has actually s- seen combat, right? Mm-hmm. And so, I, that's what I, that's why I enjoy, that's why I like this platform because it, it allows us to reconnect with each other, right? To reach out to those people, there's Ronnie McNutts, right? The, the other veterans that are struggling with with uh, suicide and depression, right? And, and let them know that they're not alone, right? And help bring that tribe back and take away some of the, the taboo that's, you know, surrounds being a man suffering from mental illness and trauma, right? And, and make it easier for them to find the help that they need and to transition back into the, you know, into the workforce and the civilian life and be, and, he, and lead a healthy and, and productive life and, and whatever it is they choose to do. Especially, yeah, and, I, and I think one of the, the things that we do that really kind of is a hindrance in that method of pushing forward is that in the veteran community, we are really, really bad at gatekeeping. Like we're really bad about attaching adjectives when adjectives aren't needed. It's just a simple noun that it, that'll suffice. And what I mean by that is if you talk to most veterans, it's almost like you have like a checklist of qualifications to have mental struggles. You'll have, I've been to combat. I've had, I've been in a firefight. I've done this many raid missions. I've been around sniper fire. I've done this. I've been injured. I've done this. I've done that. And you have all these different qualifications instead of just being a veteran. And I think this is one of the only time periods that that's really been around. Like in World War II, you don't see, I'm a World War II combat veteran. I'm a World War II veteran. That's it. Simple as that. That's enough. And I feel like a lot of times when we only tout those people who have done combat, one, you don't choose where the fuck you go. This is an all all volunteer force. 
and everybody is just sent where they get sent and you have no choice in the matter whatsoever. Yep. I spent my first four years in Okinawa. Nobody left for combat in Okinawa whenever I was there. Hardly at all, except for dog handlers. Luckily enough, I say luckily enough, three and a half years later, I finally got to go. I wasn't a worse Marine in those first three and a half years than I was after. I was the same exact Marine. The Marine Corps just didn't send me to a combat zone. And I feel like a lot of times we put extra pressure on people who didn't have the opportunity or didn't get orders to go overseas when that wasn't their fault. Like it, and yeah. it really wasn't. And we almost make them feel like lessers. They still signed up. They did everything they possibly could. The fucking generals in charge just didn't send their dumbasses. Like that was the only thing. <laughs> exactly. Like that's the yep. only difference. Yeah, that's that's actually exactly what happened to me when I got to my unit. Um, so when I enlisted, I went EOD. Uh, got into some trouble. Got got out and be, uh, be a medic. Um, after EMP school, I got to my unit and they had just came back from like, Oh, you're not going to look for bombs. Now you got to stick fucking thermometers on people's asses. Congratulations. <laughs> still, you can still find a bomb. <laughs> just, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> it's usually, he's, well, you get caught in after somebody else finds the bomb and you have to put them back together. No, 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 no. I'm saying like, he's talking about sticking something to somebody's ass. You can still find a bomb. That's yeah, true. Explosive diarrhea. That's true. Something, I mean, That's he's true. had, he's had diarrhea since Easter 2007. Mm-hmm. And you stick something in his ass, you're finding something. I'm not sure yeah, if exactly I should applaud right. you but, or feel But feel I got to, I got to my unit right when they came back from Afghanistan. Uh, so I had about about right at a year uh, where we recycled, refit, and then we deployed again. Uh, but in that year, I mean, in, in the Army, you have a distinctive feature on your uniform that tells you whether you deploy. You have a combat patch. Mm-hmm. You've got your unit patch, combat patch. I know Navy, Air Force, Marines, you guys aren't like that. Uh, but in the Army, you can physically look at somebody and say, hey, that motherfucker didn't deploy and in an infantry unit, you didn't really get a whole lot of respect until you deployed. Um, slick sleeve, right? Isn't that what they call that in the biz? Or cherry. Yeah, slick, oh, sleeve, uh, slick sleeve or cherry. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, you say, uh, you know, the talk shit. Be like, oh, I went to ranger school, went to airborne school, yada, yada. And you just look at them. You're just like, yeah, but you're not combat uh, combat tested. Mm-hmm. You can always throw in like your, or your mother approves, of you know, something. But no, I mean, but you, you don't get that respect until you've been to combat. Um, and I remember that distinctly. I remember, uh, one of my NCOs sitting next to me when we were landing in Afghanistan for the first time. And he was so excited that he was going to war with me. He was giddy. He's just like, we're, we're doing our combat landing in, in uh, um, uh, Kandahar, um, in Afghanistan. And we're tink, fucking, tink, tink, tink. we're hot. We're, we're flying down and we're like floating in our seats because, you know, you can get shot out or whatever, but we're like floating in our seats and he's just like giddy as fuck. And I'm just like, dude, what's the big deal? We're just going to war. He's like, yeah, he's like, but now you're going to see what we talked about. Cause like the deployment before ours, um, we were on the same area, but they were at, uh, Restrepo and all those other really shitty places right there that have since got closed down in the, uh, the corn goal. Um, so our, our, the deployment before mine, they were in the corn goal, the Kunar and the Pesh River Valleys. Corn got closed down, uh, when we left. And then our deployment was, uh, uh, the Kunar and the Pesh. Still very active areas, still very shitty areas. Uh, hell, our XO got the Medal of Honor while we were there. So I mean, we had a it was pretty kinetic. But Flo? yeah, hmm. yeah, you know, I love Flo. Yeah, yeah, well, he, he's been on the show. And we hang out and shit. He's a good dude. He won't respond to my uh, to my messages. <laughs> he was my XO. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't respond. No, he, doesn't he doesn't remember. Respond. <laughs> oh, hold on, I'll call him right now. You want me to call him? Yeah, on the pod? I can call him right now. Tell him to tell him to jump on the show with us. Okay, I'll call him right now. <laughs> He usually picks up, so let's see. I love it when this shit happens. <laughs> All right, let's see. This is how we got JT on. He was our, yeah, he, he was my ex. I've got no idea if he remembers me. Let's see if he answers. I'm going to look like an asshole if he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hi, you met, you met Chap's mom. Please leave a message. This is unbelievable. <laughs> usually he's a first ring guy. He's busy. He's doing med- uh, MOH stuff, man. Yeah. Well, that ruined it. Way to go, Flo. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You know, we'll make a clip of that, and uh, you can send it to him. I'll just start yeah. blasting him on social media. He's going to call you back in a little bit. Um, same thing happened. We were interviewing uh, um, uh, Ray Cash Care, and Jared Taylor calls in the middle of the show <laughs> when I've been trying to get a hold of JT. And um, he's like, yeah, yeah, he's been he's been calling me, uh, trying to get me on the show. Yeah, he was on uh, recently. 
Yeah, it was. Um, I'm, I'm a persistent fucker. You were just easy. Yeah. You're just like, yeah, fuck you, it, let's do it. He's got very soft hands, according to, uh, t- in some circles. And I mean, he just whores himself out. I mean, I'm pretty there sure that's, that's how you do it, man. I mean, honestly, God, that's how I do. I fucking slide into people's DMs and be like, hey, you want to come on the show? Cool, let's do it. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> but I imagine, okay, you say it, but not now that you're established and everybody knows who the fuck Chaps is, like, it's much easier for you to get people to come on the show. Um, yeah, I will say it's a lot easier for me to get people to come on ZBT than it was for me to come on my stupid ass podcast that I had in my closet in the shoebox. A lot easier. Well, <laughs> shit. Uh, I, when the show ends, I'm going to I'm gonna slide into your DMs. And I'm going to be like, uh, can I be on your show? And you're like, no, fuck you. You're not. <laughs> nope. Nope. Nobody knows who the fuck you are. So before I interrupted you about flow, you were saying about your deployment. Oh, I don't remember. Um, oh yeah, but yeah, you didn't get that respect until you um, until you deployed. I mean, you, you didn't get at, you didn't get as much respect, I'd say. And, and I do understand, like from a training perspective, it makes sense, right? Like if you if you are a staff NCO, if you're an NCO, and you're dealing in this generation where you haven't been to combat. It's very difficult to train your soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, whoever, Space Force, the Guardians. You're, it's very yeah. difficult to train them and for them to take you seriously like you've been there before. It'd be like taking a virgin and being like, show me how to do sex. Like, sure, you've seen footage of it. You've seen the porno version of Saving Private Ryan with Asa Akira, but you haven't actually put That's your funny. dick in anything yourself. You need to put your dick in yourself before, or, or yourself. No, no, you, you, you need to put you your dick in into something you, you before don't spit in you can mouth. actually train. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you that's what you lead in with right spitting in her mouth spit in her mouth <laughs> exactly right <laughs> oh, oh god, god. Oh. <laughs> so so okay so humble beginnings in your closet with an egg with a with an egg crate microphone what year did you come out of the closet uh probably 2016 sweet nice and it's been it's been nothing but rainbows and sunshine since right yeah, so Barstool has been great to me. Like, I've this is my fifth year at Barstool now, uh, which is crazy to think that it's been five years. And probably after my next contract, I will be at Barstool longer than I will be in the Marines, which is wild to even think about. But I'm very fortunate with, with this job. And not just because it's Barstool and it's one of the best media companies that there is one of the last like real spots where you can say whatever the fuck you want. And nobody cares. I, I really love that aspect, but I love the ability to create whatever I want to and not have to ask and not have to do any of these things. I just write whatever I want. I say whatever I want on my podcast and know that there's never going to be any backlash unless I go like, if I, you get in trouble at Barstool, you said some crazy some crazy shit where you probably <laughs> should just be off the internet forever like, if that's what happens but i love this job i love the opportunity i mean just this last weekend i had the opportunity to help raise 30 grand for this company and or this organization in minnesota that really goes out of their way to help folks who are were recently injured and you guys know from knowing people who were injured there's so much red tape around the VA, around the active duty military members who are in the hospital or not in the hospital, getting something simple, like John, the guy that I was telling you about who lost both of his legs, he was saying that he also injured his arm and the ability to use his dexterity was going away because he had some nerve damage where like some of the nerves were dying out. The doctor had told him that simple things, like something that we would view as super simple, like playing on a Nintendo DS and using the joysticks would help him regain some of that dexterity. Even though it sounds silly as shit, like the doctor was telling him that it, that's what he needed. He goes to the, this is a, a military doctor that says this, mind you. He goes to the chain of command and they're like, give us some time. It's going to take us a couple months to get this done. To get a fucking Nintendo DS. They can just drive to Target, pick it up, and that's the end of it. They're not the even expensive. plays fucking Mario and gets the ability to use his thumbs back. Seems like a no-brainer. Well, this company, this organization steps in in situations like that, and not just stuff that's just as small as a Nintendo DS, but they step in and they help folks out. My work doesn't care. I say, I'm going to go on these trips. They say, fine. We're able to raise some money by using our social media platforms. It's a beautiful way to be able to harness 
Barstool's fans to help so many different veterans. And I'm beyond grateful that I have this platform. It's just, it's really, there's, I always say that there's three or four titles that I really am proud of. Husband, dad, Marine, and Barstool Sports employee. That's it. So how do you, I mean, you have, you know, obviously you've been incredibly blessed and you're, you're extremely uh, talented and you have this platform and you've been through that process. How do you, what do you tell, you know, other veterans, you know, cause that's, that's immensely discouraging. Like, you know, like we were, like I was saying earlier, it's already, you know, an uphill climb in many ways, transitioning out under, you know, the best of circumstances, but now you have, you know, these, uh, these traumas and these, these physical illnesses and all this stuff that you mm-hmm. have to deal with. Like, what do you tell, to those service members to help them process, to help them get through, you know, and overcome those obstacles. One, I think being blunt is a, a, a God given gift of, of all Marines. Like you're just able to just shoot straight to the heart of the matter. One, it's not going to be easy. Like anybody that says that this plan or whatever you're going to do, or whatever your goals are, it's not going to be easy. One, you've worked hard before. You're about to have to do it again. None of this shit and succeeding outside of the military or succeeding inside the military, if that's where you still want to stay, none of it is easy. You've got to be able to be willing to put in the work. You've got to be able to risk failure. You've got to embarrassment because I think that that is what really holds so many veterans back is almost it's a sense of pride, right? Like, yeah. because you are whenever, no matter what branch of service you are in, when you're getting done, you are proud of your service. You're proud of who you are. You're proud of what you've became. You're proud of your leadership principles, your leadership ability. You're proud of all that. You know, your buddies are going to be watching, you know, your families are going to be watching. So when you put yourself out there, you're more likely to fail you. But trust me, no one cares because everybody fails. Like you, it's almost like that feeling, you know, when you go to a restaurant, the first time that you go to a sit down restaurant and sit by yourself and you order a steak meal or you steak and mashed potatoes and you're sitting there in a nice restaurant and you're eating by yourself. Everybody else around you is at a table for two, table for four, table for six. And you're just that one lone person at a table for one. Once you get to the spot in your life when you can realize no one gives a shit that I'm sitting here eating a steak. I'm by myself. These people don't give a fuck that I'm by myself. Uh, Once you get to that spot where you can eat a steak outside of in a restaurant by yourself, that's how you should view seeking out the career opportunities or the the opportunities that you want post-military. You're eating a steak for the first time in a restaurant by yourself. No one cares if you fail. They've all been there before. They want to have the courage to do that as well. Just do it. And tell somebody like there's, there's tons of people out there that want to help you succeed. Like part of the, one of the keys to success is reaching back and helping the next guy up. Right. Mm-hmm. Only, only in a very few circumstances are people going to try to succeed by cutting down their peers and the people right. that do that. They're, and they're those not, people won't get ahead for long. No, they're, just gonna, last long. they're just going to look like they're succeeding, but in all actuality, yeah, they might make some money, but they got a shitty reputation. People hate them. And, and you know, they're not going to succeed long term. It's those that, that go ahead, they blaze the path and they reach back and they, they help the next guy up, you know? So reach out to people. Like if, if you see somebody that's, that's uh, doing what you want to do, fuck, reach out to them. I mean, I reach out to people all the time with the podcast. Like, Hey, what the hell should I be doing at this point? Um, and I get ignored, but it doesn't stop me from reaching out. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. You gotta be, uh, you know, that's, you have to continue to be teachable and learnable and willing <laughs> Right. And I think, uh, you know, we, we actually talked about this uh, a couple of episodes ago, um, you know, veterans in the workplace and how is kind of touching on what you talked about earlier. Like, we, you know, we, we understand our experiences and the level of experience that we feel like we have. And, you know, there's, you know, and, and, and the, the challenge is figuring out how that translates into whatever industry you're trying to get into post-military. And there's a lot of people out there that, that, uh, have a chip on their shoulder veterans, you know, you have a 30 year master sergeant that gets out. Right. And now he's, 
Now his manager or his immediate supervisor is, you know, 25, 26 year old, just outside of, you know. Which is a master sergeant. Should be used to that shit anyway, because his <clears> brand new <throat> second lieutenant comes in and that motherfucker's 22. So he <laughs> should be used to it. Exactly. <laughs> but, but there's just that, it, it, there's that pride that you were talking mm-hmm. about. There's that pride and sense of, uh, I don't want to say sense of entitlement because I don't think that that encapsulates it correctly, but there's definitely that, uh, it, it's, it's. They feel like they earned it. They feel like they've earned to, and in certain ways they can. But the, the, the biggest part of that is they've got to be able to translate what they did in the military to the civilian sector. And that's something that a lot of people miss out on taking the, uh, you know, the uh, having the ability to take, OK, uh, we went to war. I was a I was a squad leader. We killed people. Um Taking that to, yeah, we put that on the resume. <laughs> no, because yeah. nobody gives you shit. Could. <laughs> you could, but, but you 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 take that very. You can be very blunt about it. You take that. You you spin it and say that you uh, you were able to lead a small team in a very high stress, fast paced environment and succeed. Yeah, you know, is it, that that ability to take something and wordsmith it into what you what you needed to be, um, and like you were saying earlier, you, they, you need to be able to take a step back. I know when I got out, I took a huge step back um, to be able to get where I wanted to be. And sometimes you get kicked back. Maybe I got kicked back. I'm not sure. Uh, probably a little bit. Probably a little bit. Of yeah. He he threw a. He, uh, he, you did throw a glass table. So I mean, there was that. There's but. um. Yeah. So. <coughs> excuse me. Um, what kind like go? What kind of struggles did you have when you were when you were transitioning going from? Wanted well, I mean, to I had a lot. I mean, that was part of the reason why I got out. I got arrested while I was still on active duty um, for aggravated assault on a police officer. Ooh, so sounds like a story. I was at a river one day and he put his hands on my wife. I put my hands back on him. Next thing I know, I was drunk as fuck. I woke up in a jail cell. I thought I had gotten a DUI. Did not get a DUI. And when they read me my charges, I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me, man. Like what happened? I had no idea what happened at all. I went back to my command and I just knew that I had thrown away everything that I had worked for like my entire life. Like everything was gone and I had to make a decision and it wasn't an instantaneous decision, but it was a decision that took place over a long period of time of, am I going to let this define me or will I get my life back on track and become and be the man that I know that I am? And I think a lot of times we look at mistakes that we make and we feel like that that mistake is a huge blunder and it defines us for who we are. And for a long time, it did define what it was. Like it went from my reputation being stellar from, I mean, being a fast track promotee and all that kind of stuff to what the fuck am I going to do? I had to pay for lawyers. I had to pay for bond. I had my family was eating nothing but hot dogs for weeks at a time. And it was like, okay, what do I need to do now? And I really buckled in and caught some breaks along the way. But to me, that is what's really important about my story is that my boat capsized. Like there's no doubt about it. My boat, my personal boat capsized. I was able to catch some of the little ripples of that capside and get myself back to shore. And once I put my feet back on solid ground, I wasn't going to look back into the water again. I wasn't going to allow myself and my future to be dictated by a moment of the biggest mistake in my life. I was going to let that influence who I am and who I wanted to be moving forward, but I wasn't going to let that define me. And I think when you look at me now, as opposed to who I was six years ago, one through counseling, and that's why I'm so huge about it. I I really believe that if I would have got the appropriate counseling after I got shot and traumatic brain injury and all that stuff, that none of that would have happened. I wouldn't res- I wouldn't have been drinking nearly as much. I wouldn't have been angry all the time. I would have had a better outlook on life. Then when I got in counseling and got on the right medication, all of those things started to, the tide started to come down a little bit. The waters got a little bit more calm. And I feel like there's so many people, maybe not to the same catastrophic of nearly fucking your life up and spending the rest of your life in prison type of thing. But there is people who can look back at my life and say, yes, I made a mistake. I got a DUI. I got an assault charge. I got whatever. It's over for me. It's not over for you. It's not. You got to work hard. You got to catch some breaks along the way. And when you catch that break, you got to fucking full out paddle and try to stand up on the board and do it. 
thing is, is if you don't catch that if you if you're not paddling if you're not actively trying to move forward from that situation you're not ever going to catch a break so if you if you run into one of those life altering catastrophic of, events and you just you don't take responsibility and you don't try to move forward past that you can get a very negative out, uh, attitude have a very negative outlook and at that point nobody's going to give you a break because if you can't take responsibility for the the mess that you cause in your own life why would anybody give you a break yeah and people are going to be willing i mean they're, they're, people are going to be willing to not give you a break right because you know these people they don't know you most of these people um and so uh, you're right i mean we've all we've all fucked up in some way uh you know i'm certainly speaking for myself and i think you have to first you know you have to forgive yourself right and you have to realize you have to make a constant effort say this is not going to define me like you were saying and choose to move forward because mm-hmm. piggybacking off what john said like unless you're unless you're just you know you just shit sunshine and rainbows like breaks are not going to just come your way like a lot of the circumstances that that it causes you know breaks and and um and, and opportunities to arise are because you put yourself in a position for those to happen and part of that is realizing how you fucked up taking ownership and moving forward and doing what you need to do to put yourself in a position where you can capitalize on those opportunities yeah exactly right and it's difficult i think there's just a lot of guys and they get they get stuck in their fucking heads right they're mm-hmm. like and they use and that's another thing too don't everybody's suffering okay whether you've been in whether you're you're a veteran or not there's people out there that are suffering you know from mental health issues don't don't use it as a crutch you cannot use it as a crutch it's got to be something that you you acknowledge and you say hey this is just part of my story right this is part of my narrative and you have to do what you can do to use it to your benefit, own it, fix it, and move forward. Yeah. And you, your story is important. Um, and I'm going to actually throw a curveball at you, chaps. Uh, I didn't warn you about this. Um, we uh, Typically, at the end of the show, I like to ask one question, but Kyle uh, stole it from me already. So I I'm didn't gonna, steal that from I'm you. Gonna, I did not steal you, that from you. You, you can from still me. ask it. I ask it what advice you would give to uh, uh, your younger self or a younger Marine getting out. Um, but I think I thought we had talk, uh, touched on it. But well, I was generalizing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a curveball at you. Do uh, you have any like kick-ass stories you want to tell? Something that's new that you have maybe not told a million times? Ugh, I mean, I definitely don't have one that I haven't told a million times. But I'll tell you my, my favorite story when I knew the Marine Corps was the right spot for me. So I knew the Marine Corps was the spot where I needed to be when I was three days into boot camp. So day three oh, at boot camp at Marine Corps boot camp, you actually get to go to where your platoon is going to be. You meet your senior drill instructor and your drill instructors. But before you do that, the company commander and the company first sergeant come out and they do what's a health and welfare inspection, essentially, where they come out. Every single recruit standing butt ass fucking naked. You're standing there online and they have to do like a check to make sure that you're good, like that you don't have any big time physical ailments that they missed at MEPS or anything like that. And whenever they get to you, everybody's lined up. Nobody's talking. You're standing in a position of attention with just your dick and 80, 89 other dicks like standing right next to you. <laughs> and they're going through. Whenever they come up to you, they do a left face <laughs> where they're standing like six inches in front of your face. They you. Have, as soon as they look at you, you start spinning around, flipping your hands over um, with your hands extended out. And uh, like for me, for instance, I would say recruit Cawthorn, Pensacola, Florida. Good evening, sir. And they they go around like that. Well, two people down from me, the company first sergeant and the company commander looked at each other. They step in front of the Marine. The Marine or the recruit starts doing his deal, going around. The first sergeant looks over at the company commander. The company commander looks at the first sergeant. They look back at each other again. The first sergeant looks at the company commander one more time and he says, fuck it, sir. If you're not going to say it, I will. Recruit, where the fuck is your penis? (laughs) He pulls back his pubic hair. It's a little micro dick. The first sergeant looks down, looks back up. He says, very well carry on and then just moves on to the next person i knew i was in the right branch at that point so so my interpretation of this story my interpretation of this story is it what you realize you made a right decision 
when you're in a room full of a My bunch of naked is. dudes. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can't be in a room with naked dudes and be like, you got a little ass dick to me, <laughs> you are not masculine enough. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> oh, did that guy ever kill himself or like what's the deal? No, with that? I, yeah, and it just fucking went on for years, dude. Because I mean, the Marine Corps is a small branch, yeah. so people would constantly really? be like, "Where the fuck is your penis, dog?" Like he was in Okinawa with us. <laughs> So are you deflecting? I mean, was this? <laughs> no, this I got a big dick. <laughs> uh, I am a big dick. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely a big dick. Um, oh, I would say that I'm, I'm I'm overly large. I get it done, right? Like, I mean, I got I got uh, I'm I, was, like a, I was at least able to get uh get deep enough to have. I got twins on the way, so yeah, I was at, at least boy. able to. Um, <laughs> get deep enough for that one of our prior uh prior guests said um something about somebody had to stick their finger in my ass in order to make that work but i guess it worked whatever that's fine i'm hung like a field mouse in a snowstorm so hung like, a, hung like a horse fly yeah in a snowstorm oh man well chaps man i appreciate you being on the show uh tell everybody where they can find you yeah you can go you can uh subscribe to our podcast me kate my uh, barstool kate and captain cons kate is also an enlisted marine she did two tours in afghanistan Cons went to Iraq. He was a West Point football player. Uh, he, I'm contractually obligated to mention that every time I talk about him. So he, <laughs> he went to West Point. Um, and we host a show called Zero Block 30. I'd love it if you checked it out. I also blog on barstoolsports.com. If you're a new parent or coming up on parenting, I'm a co-host of a show called Podfathers, where it's me and two other barstool dudes just chopping it up about dad life. And then I do a series where last year at the beginning of quarantine, I knew nothing about power tools. I never used a circular saw in my life. And now I build all kinds of shit. Um, learning the carpentry trade just in my backyard, like a fucking idiot. So check that out. That's called long time toolies, all kinds of content every single day. So just check it out. And believe it or not, guys and gals, he does this all while still suffering from chronic diarrhea. That's exactly right. Yep. Man, I uh, I feel like I'm not doing enough. Like I know how to use tools, and I'm not teaching people. I'm a I'm a commercial builder. Like I build multi million dollar buildings every day, um, and I don't teach people shit. <laughs> no, well, the gig line and your screws are fucked up on your set. Uh, it wasn't going to say anything. It's not connected. <laughs> <laughs> I just get it. It looks great. You guys did an awesome job. It looks a lot more professional than my uh, stupid ass green wall that was a mistake. I actually, uh, sure. so I built this uh, out of pallet wood that I had from leftover jobs. We did jobs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Biggest, we did biggest mistake. Like this probably would have cost me eighty bucks pre uh, when I built it to buy wood and have. It took me like fucking hours, but to take these pallets apart. But by the time I was like halfway into uh, it, I, I was already I, committed. I, I like, took the I pallets gotta, apart. I took the pallets apart. Yeah, and Thank I took you. a lot of pallets Thank apart. Let them take that shine. No, from I'm you, not. Kyle. I'm not. I'm fighting for it. Okay, I'm fighting mm-hmm. for my contribution here. I took a lot mm-hmm. of pallets apart before you got here, oh, okay. and after you left, because I live here. <laughs> he's but, okay. He's, he's anyways, exaggerating. That's if, an exaggeration. Thank you all for listening. Um, if you haven't <laughs> subscribed and liked our channel yet, please do. We would appreciate it. Uh, you can find us on all social media at Beyond the Barrel Podcast. We've got Beyond the Barrel, Beyond the Barrel Podcast. I can't even say it. I'm not going to say it. We're just going to end the show right there. Later. Asta. Awesome.